Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, today is one of those gospel texts that's tough. It's the third uh, reading that we've had from Matthew 9 through 10 here where Jesus is sending His disciples. And that's been the theme for the last couple of weeks, what it really means for Jesus to send His disciples. Not only right here, the 12 apostles to the lost sheep of Israel, but starting with last week and continuing to today, Jesus is speaking generally about those who would follow Him, His disciples. And the words today are tough to hear that Jesus isn't going to do exactly what we thought perhaps He was going to do. Even just a few verses before, He's talking about a peace and a peace that His disciples are going to bring. And then today begins with, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. You could sense it in the hymn we just sang that it's not all sunshine and roses for the disciples of Jesus. It involves suffering and sacrifice. I've even heard a pastor in a new member class say that Christianity is not for the faint-hearted, that if you've come here to not suffer and to only be told things you like to hear, you should probably go somewhere else because that's not what's going to happen. The Christian life and following after Jesus is difficult. Have you ever had to make a sacrifice for your faith? Maybe it's cost your relationship with a friend because of your faith in Christ. Or maybe you got a lower grade in class or even failed a class because of a hostile teacher. Or perhaps you lost a job or a job opportunity because of the public nature of your faith. Faith can cause relational strife among family members, as Jesus points out in our gospel reading. And not only strife, but it can even end those relationships, create seemingly impassable rifts between you and the people who are supposed to be the closest to you. As your pastor, I know some of you have experienced this. You've shared that with me, and I'm sure there are many more who haven't that know the reality of this result of following Jesus. Yet, we are blessed to live in a place where that is often the extent of our suffering for the faith. We're blessed not to live in a place where people are physically hostile to people who are Christian just because they're Christian. But there are many places throughout the history of the church and even still today where that is not the case, where this text is quite literal. One such place today is Nigeria. In Nigeria, if you do a quick search on the internet, 450 Christians have been killed in Nigeria since the beginning of May this year alone. And it's estimated that since 2009, when Boko Haram had their insurgency in Nigeria, that 50,000 Christians have been martyred for the faith in 14 years. And there are many other places throughout the world where not only are you threatened with physical death, but you're disowned by your family and rejected by those closest to you should you become a Christian. I've talked to a few missionaries who've worked in in countries where Islam is the primary religion, and that's often what they talk about is that they try to cause conversions in large groups because if it's just one person, they become ostracized and cut off from even their family. So imagine as Jesus is sending His disciples in the time that He's speaking the words of Matthew 10, the kind of environment that He's sending them into. He's already mentioned that He's sending them out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What are the wolves that He's talking about? They're potentially anyone, but there are a few big things in in the time of Jesus here that they're going to face. One is the rejection of the prevailing religious leadership of their own people, perhaps members of their own family who initially were excited that they were following the Messiah, and then when Jesus turned out not to be the Messiah they thought He was going to be, maybe they lost some relationships with those closest to them. The Bible doesn't tell us, but Jesus makes it clear that this sacrifice is an inevitable thing. 
And not only that, but the Jews are under the rulership, the rulership of the Romans. And in the cult of Rome, you are to worship the Caesar as God. And the consequences vary depending on who the Caesar is if you don't do that, but often it resulted in death. As Jesus calls for the first time in the book of Matthew for people to pick up their cross, some of the early Christians literally did bear a cross, just like Jesus, and were crucified. Or they were thrown in pits with wild animals or gladiators and killed for sport. Today is a tough word from Jesus, that what we bring, even though it brings a peace that passes understanding, may not be received with peace. But the other thing that makes this text difficult is reconciling with some of the other things that Jesus says. I mean, he's literally called the Prince of Peace. So why is he now then saying, I'm not coming to bring peace on earth, but a sword? That doesn't sound like something the Prince of Peace would be doing. And as mentioned a few verses before this, he instructs his disciples that when you go, if somebody receives you into their house, let your peace be with them and settle upon the house. We're supposed to bring the peace of Christ, but what if Christ didn't come to bring peace? How do we reconcile those things? Well, they're both true. In the text, the peace that Jesus is sending His disciples to bring wherever they go is the very purpose of His ministry, the reason He became flesh and goes all the way to the cross. It's for peace, but not a peace of this world with the mere cessation of violence, but a peace between man and God forever. But what Jesus is talking about here is that the world's reaction to that peace is not going to be peaceful. That while the purpose of which He sends us out on is to bring the peace of God which passes all understanding, the result is going to be division. After all, He's sending us out as sheep in the midst of wolves, as newly born righteous people in the midst of a sinful and fallen world, and even among ourselves with our old flesh still clinging to us. It makes sense that this is sort of the the last part of Jesus' instructions to His disciples. He's giving them a realistic expectation of what they can expect to experience as they bring His peace into the world. And make no mistake, Jesus did and does bring a peace that passes understanding. Just like you have each experienced a sacrifice for your faith, you've also experienced that peace. Finding yourself at ease in situations where you shouldn't, and peaceful when there seems to be no peace around because you have been made right with God. So today's text is more about the nature of Christ's peace that He brings, the peace that He attaches to each of us as we go out into the world. It's an alien peace. It's a peace not of this world. Some will hear it and receive it with joy, and your peace will settle with them, and others will reject it. And Jesus makes it quite clear that they will reject it not because you said it in a mean way or you didn't say it in smart enough big words or terms but because they're rejecting the gospel. They're rejecting Him. And the nature of this division informs us of what's at stake. Nothing short of the eternal salvation of human souls. The identity of Jesus and faith in Him. That is what must remain And it must remain even in the place of your most intimate earthly relationships. Jesus is telling His disciples that now that you are following Me, I am number one. Even if your spouse or your parents or your children try to tell you to do something different, to call you after their ways instead of mine, you must stick with mine. Sometimes that looks like Christian family members lovingly and bearing and patient compassion, enduring attacks from non-Christian family members, and just constantly seeking an opportunity where it seems like maybe you've said it so many times they don't want to hear it. 
Other times, it can be non-Christian family members demanding that you live the way they live, not understanding why you make the decisions that you make. And despite your best efforts to be loving and compassionate, the rift is created. So why? Why should I go when Jesus calls? This path seems difficult and hard. The cost seems so high. Because what's at stake is worth it. What's at stake is the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and faith in Him, not only for you, but for those to whom He sends you. And like Paul says, He doesn't consider any of the sufferings of this present life worth comparing to the glory that that brings. So if Jesus is the Son of God, that's what we have faith in, then what He says is true. And here's what He says. He says, you are a sinner dead in your sins. He says, you need to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, He is the Son of God, the Christ, the promised Messiah. He says that God loves you even though you're a sinner. He says that God has sent Him to forgive our sins and pay the price for our wrongdoing. That is true, the word that He is attaching to you and sending you out into the world with. Then apart from Him, there is no life. The Bible tells us that before Jesus comes along, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. The sentence had been carried out. The wages of sin is death. We were all doomed to the same fate, death and not life. This is why when Jesus says in our text today that if you focus on your earthly life, you will lose your life because in your earthly life, there is no life at all. It is a life doomed to death because of sin. And by clinging to it, you flee from the only real life you can have, which is in Jesus Christ. That's what he means when he says, if you forsake your life, if you lose your life in this world, you'll find that you have gained it, because in Him is real life, eternal life. Life in Him is the only real life. And so it is worth it to suffer and sacrifice and even die for it, because in Him you have eternal life. It's also worth it because that's what He's sending to bring through you to those whom you love, those whom you don't know, and those whom you've just met, so that they too may have the only real life there is, life in Jesus. Now, another significant thing happens in this text in the book of Matthew. This is the first time in the entire book of Matthew that the word cross is mentioned, where Jesus hasn't even begun to explain what the cross is going to be now that He's taking it up, which is what we understand. That's why we have crosses all around. But if we had the disciples' current understanding in Matthew chapter 10, we wouldn't have crosses anywhere near anything we care about. The cross was the sign of slavery, criminality, and execution in the Roman Empire, reserved for the worst sorts of criminals. And here Jesus is invoking that image to describe what is borne by those who follow Him, that they must take up a cross and follow. Now, this is a fitting image for the text today. He's giving them the realistic expectation of what they can expect will happen when they bring His peace, because it's the very thing that is going to happen to Him. The division that Jesus is describing for His disciples, He experienced Himself, estrangement from His own family because He's now the Messiah. Not just His family, but those He grew up with. When He goes to His own town and He begins to preach and teach what God has given Him to preach and teach, they try to kill Him. They reject Him. They say, who's this? Isn't this the carpenter's son? How come He says these things? And maybe somebody said something similar to you. Maybe you lived a life that wasn't worthy of God before you became a Christian, and now that you're starting to say things, people are like, who are you? I know you. This isn't you. And of course, we know ultimately a rejection from His very own chosen people 
epitomized on the cross. But the cross is not a result of failure for Jesus. Despite its suffering and its pain, it was the purpose of his ministry. It was the seat of the peace that he comes to bring. And it makes sense that the world doesn't understand it because who brings peace by dying a criminal's death on a cross for things that they didn't do? And yet that is the peace our God brings. The only peace that restores our relationship to God and gives us real eternal life. So why take it? Why take this road of following Jesus if this is what we can expect? Because in Him is the only place of real life, not only for you, but for those whom He sends you to. God plans to use you by attaching Himself to you, which He does in your baptism, by teaching you His Word so that you go out and says the things that He says so that people may encounter Him through you and may come to know the truth of what He says, that yes, they're sinners, but God loves sinners like them and sent Jesus to die on the cross to give them real life and eternal life. Because when we join with Jesus, or rather when He joins with us, we're not just joined to His suffering. And he emphasizes this at the end of our text today. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Do you love your family, even those that are at odds with you? Do you love your neighbor, even those who persecute you? In Christ, we're called to love even our enemies. Why? So that they can know Jesus. Because Christ is the only way to real life. And you are one of the ways in which He's bringing life to the world. As Lutherans, we believe in a God that works through means. Guess what? You're one of those means. He has bound Himself to you and sent you out with the very mercy and compassion which brings the peace that you have that has no business being in a world like ours. And yet, because Christ came down, here it is for you. Now He wants us to bring that peace wherever we go. Dear friends in Christ, He ends with a word of encouragement. The King goes with you. This echoes what He'll say later in Matthew 28 at the very end with the great commission to the whole church, that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You're not only joined in Christ's suffering, but you're joined to Him totally not just His death, but His life. His Spirit has been given to you in order to bear these sufferings because the glory that is to come, the real life that Jesus has come to bring for you and all those to whom He sends you, is worth it. A lot has been covered in these couple chapters of Matthew. Jesus is sending out His disciples. He's sending out you. And reborn through Christ, you now have real life a life that this world desperately needs, and God is sending you to bring it. So, we follow Him. We answer His call. Though the way may be hard and painful at times, our Lord bore the cross so that we can have ultimate peace, a peace with God. Our way is fueled by a sacrificial love, love for those to whom we are sent, whether they love us back or not so that they may come to know by the power of the Holy Spirit that they too have life in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen.